It's a great pleasure to be here and tell you a little bit about what I do, which is artificial intelligence. Um, so my story is that I grew up in Romania back in the days when it was a communist country, so things were pretty dreary. And as a result, uh, you know, being rebellious teenagers, we did very radical things, like watching pirated sci-fi movies, because um, there wasn't very much else radical to do. Um, and so I grew up looking at androids like Data and at robots, and I thought, you know, this is really cool. I would really like to build something like that. So it really inspired me to actually go and study computer science at university. And one of the first um, sort of significant assignments that I had there uh, was to build a program that could play chess. Now, chess is a game that people consider a hallmark of intelligence, so I thought, okay, this is pretty good, we're going to actually make some steps here to build some robots, and then I read the details of my assignment, and these details said, well, you know, think about how you play chess, and then take those rules and program them. Now, it turns out I'm really a lousy chess player, uh, so all I could do is basically tell the program some very, very basic things about how the pieces move, it wasn't really very good. Now, I decided to not give up, and so I went to grad school. And at the beginning of my grad school, actually, a watershed moment for artificial intelligence happened. This is a picture uh, that was uh, in the news at the time. Uh, this is Gary Kasparov, who was the world chess champion, being beaten by a computer. And the computer was uh, called Deep Blue. It was a creation of IBM. And really, all of us who were studying AI were very inspired by this. We thought, OK, now this is true intelligence. A computer is better than a person. A game that we would really consider uh, to be very significant. And so, you know, very enthusiastically, we went and we read the papers that described the technology. And then we realized that actually this was an amazing feat, but it was essentially a human feat. There was a computer that was purpose-built to play chess. That's all it could do. It was really, really good at playing chess. Um, but it was very special and couldn't do much of anything else. Also, people sort of thought very carefully about how masters played the game, and they built this capability into the computer. So it was amazing, but it wasn't quite what I was looking for. Now, here we are, uh, 20 years later, and actually things have moved quite a bit. So these are some pictures taken from um, the games of uh, Lisa Dahl and KG, who played also a computer program, this time at the game of Go. Now, Go is an ancient game that is considered significantly harder than chess. Um, it involves strategy as well as tactics, and it is um, sort of considerably more difficult also because there's many, many, many possible moves, and people have to think at various levels. How do I capture territory? How do I defend? And so on. And it turns out that this program called AlphaGo and its sort of uh, next version called AlphaZero actually uh, was really, really good to the point that it is now essentially the world's best Go player. And it made the cover of Nature and a lot of us got very excited about it. And we now have, in fact, a much more interesting way of doing this kind of um, sort of feat which is not so much engineering. So this is what I want to tell you about. How do these programs actually play the game? It turns out that they're not so much programmed as they learn how to do it. Now, when you think about learning, kids learning, one of the things that comes to mind is going to school. Okay? So if you go to school, you have a teacher, the teacher tells you various things, you kind of ingest them, and then you learn how to do stuff. Um, that's one way to do learning in computers. It's called supervised learning. So you can have, for example, a computer that wants to learn how to label images. How do we do this? Well, we show the computer a lot of images where somebody has gone in and actually labeled the things that are interesting. So in this case, we want the computer to learn how to label faces. And so somebody's gone in the image and drawn some little squares around the faces. And now we're going to show this information to the computer. The image is just a set of pixels and we know what we're looking for in the image, and so now we can show the computer lots and lots and lots of images, millions of images as it turns out, and it will learn how to recognize faces. Now, what does the computer have inside? It has a little brain, it's called an artificial neural network or a deep network, it's in the picture over there. It really has some very small units that can do very simple things, okay, like compute 
a cert certain line function, or maybe like a little squiggly line function. So each of these are very, is very, very simple, kind of like a human neuron. The power comes from the connections. The connections have numbers on them, and these numbers get trained. Some of them get high, some of them get low. And each of these little units, that's a very specialized kind of thing. So for example, some of them are going to just simply learn to recognize edges or lines in the image. Some of them are going to actually uh, recognize certain kinds of faces. Turns out some of these neurons actually learn how to recognize cats. Okay. Why? Well, because a lot of the images on the internet are cats and dogs and so on. And so we now have these wonderful artificial brains that are really, really good at recognizing cats from all angles and all different breeds. <laughs> so this is interesting. This is part of the way um, how, how AlphaGo does things, in fact. Okay. So what do I mean by that? Initially, AlphaGo was trained by looking at a lot of games that people play, good sort of uh, grandmaster level. Uh, players and essentially thinking the move that they did was the right move. Okay, and so the program learns how to reproduce these moves. Now, this is great, it's very interesting, leads to a very powerful program, but there's one catch here, which is this requires a lot of data that is provided by people. Okay, with the images, we need millions of images labeled by people. Now, people get bored very quickly of this kind of task. And in some cases, like in the game of Go, there actually aren't that many games that are played by grandmasters that we can look at for information. So now if we think back at how people learn, yes, you learn things in school, but actually you learn tons of stuff even before you go to school. You learn how to recognize objects and what colors are, and you learn to count, and you learn to interact with the world in various ways. And so that's the kind of process we would like to mimic in a computer. It's a different kind of learning called reinforcement learning. And it turns out that this is not even just something that people do, but animals do it. It's very widespread in the natural world. And so in one picture there, you have a little mouse that's learning a task. The task is essentially to press a sequence of levers in order to get some food. And the mouse just kind of does things at random, stumbles upon the levers, when it gets the right levers, it gets the food, and that's its reward, okay? That feels good. So now the mouse is happy, and that reward kind of triggers a path of learning that makes it remember what were these things I did that led me to the reward. It turns out we can train computers in much the same way through reinforcement learning. So you think of the computer program now as being exposed to the world, it watches the world, it can do things, it's allowed to experiment, and as a result of what it does, it may receive a reward. Now this could be a positive reward, a number, and it could be a negative number. And the goal of the computer is to find actions that essentially give it as large a number as possible. That's a bias that we put in. But it's never told the actual thing that it should do. It's allowed to experiment. The other interesting thing is that these numbers might come much later than when the action has happened. Okay? For those of you who are going to university, you probably you know, expect some reward at the end of the day when you get your degree, okay? but it's going to take some years to get there. And so rewards can be very delayed, yet somehow they still reinforce our actions. So that's in fact how AlphaGo learns. It looks at the board. It tries something, does some actions. There's no feedback until the end of the game. At the end of the game, it observes whether it's won the game or it's lost the game. And if it's won the game, it's going to make all of the actions that happen during that game a little bit more likely, because they obviously led to a good outcome. And if the game was lost, all of those actions are going to become a little bit less likely. So that's the basic principle. And now, the program is just going to sit there in its happy computer corner and just play millions and millions of games by itself. It turns out that this leads the best program in the world. Not only that, but because the program is not really told what's the right thing to do, because it learns by experimentation, it can in fact invent new ways of playing that are different from what people believe. So this is a graph that's showing alpha go zero learning. Okay, performance is high. The higher, the better. So this is its, its rating. 
And after three days, it actually surpasses the ability of AlphaGo-Lee. This is the version that beat Lee at all. That was trained much by supervised learning. And then after 21 days, it actually reaches the level of master, which is the one that defeated KG. And at the end of the training, after 40 days, it becomes so good that it beats the previous version 100 games to nothing. So it's absolutely the best Go player in the world. What else is interesting about this program is that now there's no special purpose hardware, okay? It runs on a regular computer. And the algorithm is actually very general. There's nothing in the algorithm that we told the computer that is specific to the game of Go. We just told it, you should prefer to win. And now go off and just play lots of games and figure it out. So that's a very powerful concept because it generalizes to many, many different situations. Now, of course, I'm very happy with games, and many of us computer scientists are very happy with games, but there's actually real applications to this. And so in our lab, we look at all kinds of ways that artificial intelligence and these kinds of learning methods can be applied. One of these pictured here is a project we have going on at the Children's Hospital, which is looking at very premature babies. So in this case, the babies are born, they're very small, they cannot breathe on their own, and so they're hooked up to a ventilator. And now we would like to figure out when that are they actually ready to be taken off of that ventilator machine. And that's a decision that's typically done by a doctor, but the doctor needs help because actually they're not always there to observe the baby, and so they have limited amounts of information. And also, there's a lot of noise that's a clinical setting. The babies get picked up and put down, the sensors lose contact, and so on. So what we do is we gather data in the hospital setting, and now we want a computer to essentially predict the risk that the baby would incur if it were to be extubated right now. And in this case, the computer is not actually experimenting with taking actions. It's simply learning to predict the right outcome, and it's being rewarded for predicting the right outcome. There's another application that I'll show you here, which is um, we have some data, it's image data. It's very corrupted. I'm not sure if you can tell what's in this image. Okay, it's a little bit hard to tell. But if I let the computer do its job, Okay, you see some digits appearing in the image. Now, this is a task that's called fixing corrupting data or data imputation in statistical uh, terms. It's a problem where you have to look at the data that's there in order to kind of guess as, at what's not there. And people are good at this when a little bit of data is missing, but they're not so good at it when a lot of data is missing. And you can kind of see that it's gonna be hard for you uh, to, to recognize these images and to kind of fill, fill in the gaps without any help. So what the computer does is it looks at the image, it looks at the context of what's missing, and it can decide to fill in a pixel or not. And it kind of does this over time, little by little, and again, it's rewarded by obtaining at the end the right answer. But once it's trained, it can do this on any other kinds of images. So in the context of this presentation of giving voice, I think it's really important for us to think of how we're going to use these very powerful tools now in our lives. They are available. Some of you probably use them every day. If you interact with, with your phone, you talk to your phone, your voice, phone does some voice recognition. Um, if you do translation, Google Translate, you're going to interact with these kinds of methods. How are we going to make use of this so that this technology can actually help us improve? And I hope that all of you can think of some useful ways of doing it. Thank you.